Hi, welcome or welcome back to my channel. If you don't know me, my name is Anna. Oh, <laughs> it looks like Chianti's having some fun. Um, like I was saying, I'm Anna. I'm a doctoral intern in clinical psychology. And today we're gonna talk about why people develop social anxiety. If you enjoy this channel, this type of content, I invite you to hit like and subscribe to see more. And let's just get straight into it. On the biological slash genetic aspect of things, evolutionary theory says that it basically makes sense to want other people to like you. It's important so that you thrive, so that you have a pack, so that you're not isolated and alone. You're not the only one ensuring your own survival. And so it stands to reason that it's a good thing if you want other people to like you and you're a little bit of anxious about making that happen. And so probably because of something to do with that, there is a genetic piece where social anxiety tends to run in families with about 13 to 76% heritability. Genetics have been found to predict how constant social anxiety is, but environment helps you to get better. So in other words, environmental factors like bullying are less likely to give you long lasting social anxiety than genetics are. Then there are also individual factors, things related to the person themselves, not necessarily genetics or environment. One is insecure attachment. I'm not going to go into all of the different attachment styles and how those correlate or don't correlate with social anxiety, but just to give you a brief rundown, people with social anxiety tend to be more insecurely attached and that certainly makes sense if you think about like early childhood infancy experiences. If you were neglected as a child or mistreated as a child, very early on you learned that other people are not safe, that they can't be trusted, or that you need to completely rely on yourself. And so that can definitely affect your attachment style even later on in life as well. Behavioral inhibition is also correlated with social anxiety. So this is kind of with a lot of different anxiety disorders, but behavioral inhibition is basically when you're very good at saying no to yourself, very good at stopping yourself from doing certain things that you may want to do because of fear of repercussions or fear of social consequences from other people. And so understandably, people with social anxiety are very good at avoiding things, very good at safety behaviors and inhibiting themselves from doing behaviors that they might want to do because they don't want to experience punishment or embarrassment from other people. Perfectionism is also correlated with social anxiety and is thought to be part of the etiology. People with social anxiety tend to be very perfectionistic in other areas of their life as well, but particularly when we think about social interactions, wanting to make no mistakes, to say everything perfectly all the time, to never be misinterpreted, to never have conflict, to be like a picture perfect person in every situation. Unfortunately, that is not realistic, not feasible, not likely to happen. And when people do have minor slips or even major slips, it tends to worsen their social anxiety because they think, there we go, this is what I thought. This is exactly what I suspected. I'm awkward, I'm shy, I'm socially anxious, I'm incompetent socially, other people can tell, and it just kind of feeds into itself as a loop. High introversion and low extroversion, basically same construct, it's one spectrum, is also associated with social anxiety. People who are socially anxious tend to be more introverted and less extroverted. Part of this could be that people who are socially anxious might just not feel very comfortable around other people. They might not feel safe. It might feel to them a little bit like they have to put on a mask all the time. They have to constantly be on high alert. They have to constantly be performing at peak capacity. And as you can imagine, that's pretty exhausting for people. And what is introversion? It's getting energy refilled from being alone. And so of course, if other people exhaust you, then you're going to be more of an introvert where you refill that energy from yourself. That isn't to say that there aren't extroverted, socially anxious people. There definitely can be. And I think there can be certain presentations of social anxiety where people overcompensate for their anxiety. And so they're actually even more extroverted, more talkative, more outgoing, more chatty. And that's a little bit unusual, but it can happen. People with social anxiety also tend to place a great deal of emphasis on what other people think of them. So it's sort of a matter of values. If you think about it, a person who does not care what other people think is going to move through life without much social anxiety versus a person who does place a great deal of emphasis on it 
is going to experience social anxiety because they want to make sure that this core value of theirs is fulfilled. And so I actually have a video on what types of situations should you care what other people think of you and what other situations maybe should you not care so much that don't really necessarily affect your well-being and might be just a burden for you to care about. And then we also know that social anxiety disorder is comorbid with substance abuse, depression, panic disorder, and other anxiety disorders. So to kind of take each of them one at a time, <laughs> so cute. Sorry, I had to. I, she's so cute. I got a little distracted. Social anxiety disorder is very compatible with substance abuse disorders because it's often a way of self-medicating. For people with social anxiety, something like alcohol, which is considered a social lubricant or liquid courage, can make people feel a little bit more normal, can make them feel like they can finally let go of that behavioral inhibition a little bit and be themselves and be social and not worry so much about what other people think. And with other substances as well, you know, like stimulants tend to make people more chatty and like upbeat and outgoing in that way. Depressants like cannabis can sometimes make people just more relaxed and less anxious in situations. Of course, it can very much have the opposite effect as well, where people get extremely paranoid and extremely socially anxious. I've seen it go both ways. But to summarize, social anxiety is very, very prime fertile soil for substance abuse issues to come up because because people want to feel socially comfortable and normal and relaxed with other people and sometimes substances are just the quickest fix for that. Depression is comorbid with social anxiety because we are social creatures, most of us, unless we have like a schizoid personality type and even then some people would argue those people also need connection. We rely on other people if only because at some point we're gonna need something from other people. At some point Either we're feeling extremely intense emotions or something's going on where we need support, we need someone to lean on, someone whose shoulder to cry on. In those situations, if you don't have someone, if you don't have anyone that you can lean back on because maybe you've been avoiding social interactions or maybe you haven't been building the skills to interpersonally interact with other people, then you could very easily fall into depression. Depression and social anxiety also both sort of rely on avoidance. Depression is more so like low energy, low motivation, and social anxiety is avoidance out of anxiety. So kind of from different reasons, but both of them rely on people not really doing much, not going out, not doing activities, and in turn feeling worse and worse about themselves. Panic disorder is also comorbid with social anxiety because as you can imagine, sometimes that anxiety can get to such a pronounced point that it actually triggers a full-blown panic attack. So those are some of the individual factors, and let's touch on the environmental ones now. There are some environmental factors that play a role even before a person is born. So when a mother is pregnant, maternal stress during pregnancy, maternal partner changes, you know, like people coming and going, which stresses her out, economic hardship, deviance either from her and or her partner can all affect the unborn developing person inside her. Because if she has high levels of cortisol, which is the stress hormone, that can affect the child both biologically and psychologically. We know that women who are more stressed out during pregnancy tend to experience more problems in their children. Then once the child is actually born, there are some other parenting issues that are highly correlated with the development of social anxiety that are also environmental. These include over control, so parents who are overly controlling, kind of what it sounds like, lack of warmth or rejection, and overprotection. So why might these things cause a child to go on to develop social anxiety? If a child is over-controlled, is told, don't do this, don't do that, I want you to live your life in a specific way, they're going to be very behaviorally inhibited because they're going to internalize that. They're going to hear their parents' voice every time they want to do something sort of criticizing them, that inner critic that we've spoken about before. If a parent is not warm, not affectionate, a child could feel emotionally neglected and can feel like, I can't rely on other people. I can't be sure that other people are gonna meet my needs. And so I need to get very good at meeting my own needs and avoiding other people because other people are just going to hurt me, just going to reject me and are just going to leave me feeling abandoned. And then overprotection has a similar effect to over control. Sometimes it's not because a parent wants to control or like exert power over a child necessarily, but just wants to make sure that they're safe but it is important for children to get in the habit of exploring their environment and not being so scared and not being so cautious because 
part of learning and growth is falling down, making mistakes. And parents who strongly discourage their kids from doing so can actually set them up for failure. So understandably, anxious parenting is also correlated with development of social anxiety. Insensitivity is, you know, if you're constantly hearing someone be critical or say mean things to you and sensitive things to you, understandably, you're going to not trust people as much. You're going to feel hurt by other people and going to try to avoid them restrictiveness, social isolation. You know, I think it's very common coming from an immigrant family myself, there is this tendency for immigrants in particular to kind of discourage their children from branching out socially and having uh, social roots in other places other than the family. It's kind of a this us versus them mentality. And in a lot of ways that is because of being othered by the general society. But that again can set up children for failure because if you're isolated, you're not building those social skills, you're getting more socially inept, and in the future you're going to be more self-conscious about that, and you're sort of learning to not trust the other world and not trust other people. Criticism from parents, shame tactics, behavioral rigidity, and concern with the opinions of others. So as you can understand, if a parent is overly concerned with what other people think, then the child is also likely to become very concerned with what other people think. It might not even be there personal value, it might just be something that they've internalized from their parent that they're not even realizing doesn't resonate with them. Parents with mental illness also tend to experience more internalizing symptoms in children. So internalizing are things that they kind of turn on themselves as opposed to externalize onto the world around them. Internalizing problems in children are associated with psychopathology in the mother, so mental illness or symptoms in the mother whereas externalizing problems are linked with psychopathology in both parents, which is interesting. So if you have a mother who has a mental illness or symptoms of a mental illness, you're more likely to internalize your problems and to probably develop social anxiety versus if both of your parents have mental issues, you're more likely to externalize it through things like behavioral problems. And then there are, of course, traumatic events, which are basically a risk factor for developing any sort of mental illness, and that is no exception with social anxiety. Things like divorce, death, illness, natural disasters, changing schools, academic failure, bullying, familial violence, and abuse can all be traumatic experiences that causes someone to develop social anxiety. Divorce, understandable. It's you know, family turmoil, family conflict. You might start to fear family conflict, not know if you can trust that other people are gonna stick around. Death, same thing, you're feeling a sense of like, can I really rely on other people because sometimes they just end up leaving me. Changing schools, you know, for kids, it's really difficult to go into a new school, not knowing anyone, kind of all eyes on them. Everyone has already fully developed friendships and circles and it's a lot of pressure, especially if they're shy, especially if they're introverted. I was reflecting on this for myself recently. I moved around a lot as a kid. It occurred to me that the reason I sort of avoided other people during recess wasn't just social anxiety. It was also because school is a lot of interaction. For introverts, it can be very overstimulating. It's like, you have to participate in class, you have to do small group projects, you have to interact with different people, and then you go off to recess and you're expected to do even more of it. And for introverts, it's like, okay, well, I kind of want to relax now, I kind of want to just like lean back, enjoy solitude, not talk, not interact, recharge, refuel my energy, and if other people look at you and say, that's weird, or like, I pity that, like you don't have any friends, then that's kind of doubly disempowering because you don't feel like you even have a right to recharge your energy in the way that you need. But anyway, it's kind of just a detour. Just about, you know, talking about the way children who are socially anxious, who are introverted, can struggle a little bit in school. Understandably, it's even more so if it's constantly new school, new people, new judgments from people. And of course, things like bullying and abuse of any kind are going to make you feel like you can't trust other people, like other people want to hurt you and that you should avoid them. Also getting a new step parent can cause the development of social anxiety, you know, new people in your home suddenly feeling a little bit out of your element and marital discord. Lower socioeconomic status is also associated with higher development of social anxiety. This is interesting, but it kind of makes sense because if you're in a world where your basic needs are not met, other people are maybe focused 
on getting certain resources that you literally need in order to survive, then you're probably going to have a sense that moving through the world isn't safe for you or that other people can't be trusted or won't necessarily be there for you when you need it. And then also collectivistic cultures are associated with higher rates of social anxiety. There is sort of a social anxiety equivalent in, in East Asia in places like Japan and Korea called Taijin Kyofusho, which is more so a fear of embarrassing other people or offending other people as opposed to embarrassing yourself. And that really speaks to the collectivistic nature of social anxiety in those cultures because it's not so me focused, it's you focused. Like, I don't want you to be offended. I don't want you to be ashamed. And then I'm going to feel anxious about trying to ensure that that happens. So that's really interesting as well. And then there are gender roles. So t social anxiety is more common in women and that is largely because of the way we are socialized to take more care in other people to sort of take on this caretaking role, put our needs on the back burner in order to make sure that everyone else is comfortable. We feel like imposters quite a lot, even if we're well educated in the topic, it's sort of like, what do you know? And so we're kind of wallowing in the sense of self-doubt. It doesn't always fit the facts of the situation. And so this results in a lot of girls being socialized to grow up into women who are socially anxious and unsure of themselves. I've put my references and also a social anxiety workbook in the description box below, so check those out if you'd like to read more. Please feel free to comment if there's something that you feel like I missed or if you want to share your own story about social anxiety. I hope that this is something that we can all destigmatize a little bit because I think there's a sense that social anxiety is like something to be ashamed of or a sign of weakness. And a lot of people really struggle with this. And so I think it's normal to acknowledge that some people are shy, some people are anxious. They have good reason to be given their biology, individual factors, environmental factors. It's nothing to be ashamed of. We can move past this. Hope you have a great day.